Our second speaker on the panel is Eric Hurst, the Duane Rath Professor of Economics and the Neubauer Faculty Fellow. He studies macroeconomic policy, consumption, entrepreneurship, and household financial behavior. His article, Liquidity Constraints, Household Wealth and Entrepreneurship, published in the Journal of Political Economy, is a must read for how individual actions intersect with larger societal forces and thus affect business cycles. He won the 2006 TIA CREF Paul Samuelson Award for outstanding scholarly writing on lifelong financial security. Thanks to Eric also for returning to the BFL this year. Bad design now? Yeah. Uh, Ragu gave everybody gifts and I didn't bring anything. So <laughs> I'm going to be extra good with my forecast, hopefully, to compensate. I'm only going to talk about three things today. I'm going to try to be as focused as I can with these three things. I'm not going to talk to you about China. I'm not going to talk to you about Greece. I'm not going to talk to you about inflation or deflation. I'm not going to give you a death watch in Marvin's absence. Um, I'm going to give you, I'm going to talk a little bit about the housing market, how I expect consumers to respond coming out of this recession, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the state of unemployment in the economy today. And I'm going to try to tie those three things together with one common theme. And the theme that we're going to talk a little bit about today is going to be misallocation. And what do I mean by misallocation? It's going to be a, a phrase that I'm going to come back to a little bit where during the boom years, ex post we might have done things, ex ante we might have done things optimally, but ex post we seem to have distorted our behavior towards certain activities during the run up to this recession. We built a lot of houses, we saved very little money. We changed the nature of production in the U.S. in ways that we hadn't done in the previous two, three, four decades. And I'm going to show you that as a result of that misallocation during the run-up, what we did during the boom years, it's going to affect how we think about the recovery today. So let's start with the housing market. For those of you who have been here a couple of years, I kind of returned to the housing market. A few years ago, I kind of told you we should have expected big collapses in the housing market and why we should have expected big collapses in the housing market. And I'm going to kind of return to that today um, to kind of forecast what should we expect from this point going forward. So those of you, again, I'm going to talk a little bit with the slides today. So I have a lot of graphs for you. The picture you're seeing in front of you is the percentage increase in housing prices in the United States for each year. It's actually each, yeah, it's each year um, going back to the 1970s. So each one of those dots is a percentage point increase. And we've seen this picture before in newspapers, CNN. Starting in around 1997, there was a massive run-up in U.S. housing prices um, um, overall that we haven't seen in, the, in the, the, at least in the measured country's history. We had this big run-up in prices. Now, why was that? There's lots of stories. Interest rates were really low, cheap capital from the world. People had expectations about the housing market, maybe bubble-type stories. People wanted to get in on the bubble. I'm not, whatever was going on, people started reallocating a lot of resources to the purchasing of housing. And how did we respond to that as an economy? We built a lot of housing. So the next slide shows you quarterly housing starts starting in the, the mid-1970s. And what you can see is there's a massive run-up starting around 1997 when the prices started rising. Optimizing agents in the economy could buy a piece of land for a dollar, okay, put a house on it and sell it for three dollars. Okay, so what do we do? We started building a lot more houses. So housing supply went up dramatically, dramatically during this time period. Basically, the 10 years between 1997 and 2007 we built 40% more housing than any decade prior in the United States history, any other 10-year period. We had a massive amount of allocation of resources to housing. And if you take a look at how we allocate our production in the economy, okay, normally, historically, relatively stable, about 4% of all production in the United States goes to residential investment, basically building houses. And that's what it was in 1997. About 4% of all production in the economy went to the housing production sector. But by 2006, there was a 50% increase. 6% of all of GDP in the United States was going to the production of housing. We had a massive run-up, a structural change, if you will, in the run-up to, to how we view the, this housing sector. And as a result, we built a lot of housing. And now, when people reverse their demand, they want less housing than they did yesterday. They basically go back to 1997 expectations. 
there's a huge excess supply of housing on the market right now. Roughly 2.3% of all residential homes are vacant. Okay, that's a huge increase relative to steady state that we would see during normal times. So we have this glut of housing on the market. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's look to historical data. And some of these plots you might have seen for those of you who were here a couple of years ago when I was trying to forecast the big collapse. How do I do that? Let's look at data from other areas that had big housing run-ups in the past and see what happened ex post. And this is a picture of New York, housing prices in New York. So while the U.S. as a whole hasn't had a big misallocation of towards housing, Certain country or certain subparts of the country, New York in particular, during the 80s had a massive misallocation towards housing. So look at those dots. Each one of those dots is a percentage increase year over year in housing prices in New York. Okay? Look at the 80s. Basically, in, from 84 to 89, there was a 50% run up in housing prices in New York. Basically, the 6% plus the 9% plus the 12% adds up to about 50%. Lots of sub-areas of the U.S., California, Rhode Island, lots of countries, Ireland, Italy, Japan, lots of cities, Vancouver, have patterns that look like this in their history. And all of them follow a very similar pattern. Once the collapse in housing prices occur, you get a decade, a decade almost, of relatively stable nominal prices, slightly negative real prices in housing. So people who are expecting a big housing price recovery on the backside of this collapse are going to be misguided. It just doesn't happen in the data. And, I have, and I'll even go further, and I, I hardly ever say this. I can't find one counterexample where I see a big massive run-up where there's a misallocation, an extra production of supply, and when housing prices collapse, they don't stay depressed or don't stay non-growing for a substantial period of time. So if we're going to look forward and expect a housing price recovery, it's just not going to come. So I'm going to give you three predictions today. Prediction number one is for those of us looking for a housing price recovery, a big bounce back after the collapse, it just doesn't happen in the data. You're basically going to get many years of normal housing price growth, which is essentially 0 to 1% real. Okay? If we take long averages across all countries, across all cities, across all states, it's about 1% real. And we're going to get something a little less than that for the next you know, decade. But we're getting, for those of you looking for 3% or 5% or 7% to come back in the housing price, it just doesn't exist in the data. Okay, so I can't find a counterfactual example where you get that kind of recovery coming out. We have a glut of supply and nothing else that tells me we're going to get another big demand shock to get us out of this. Prediction one. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about consumers and what they did during this run-up and how we could think about what happens in the run-up during the recovery. And Randy touched a little bit on this. This is a saving grade. You guys have seen lots of pictures on this um, over the last, you know, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, one year, um, which is basically the saving rate was really high in the 70s, kind of collapsed to the mid 80s, kind of stayed roughly stable, trending down a little bit to 97, and then it plummets after 97. And if you take a look at what happened 97 to 2006, the saving rate goes from somewhere around 4 or 5% down to 1, 2%, even zero in some of the periods. The same thing that caused us to get the run up in housing, how was that purchases of housing funded? It was funded by basically us increasing our leverage. Okay? We bought these big homes with high prices that we put some money, very little money in, hoping that the house value would stay big. Okay? And that kind of makes sense. We'd still have a lot of wealth because we had the house value if those house prices stayed high forever. Now, what happened after the housing market collapsed and we go into the recession? We go through a period of deleveraging. Okay? We have to accumulate all the assets that we should have been doing for the last decade. As we were, our, house, our savings rate was abnormally low, we have to build up those resources again. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means... Hold up, put your, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Hold up, sorry. What it means is that when we took a look at this recovery we might find less consumption growth coming out of this recovery than we would normally expect. Randy said that consumption growth is 3%. That's kind of normal. Historically, for normal times, it is, but not coming out of big recoveries. So this picture right here is an a, uh, assessment of the size of the GDP loss during a recession in the x-axis. And on the y-axis is the one-year recovery rate in GDP once the recession is over. 
Those red dots are what happened on historical recessions. And people keep saying big recessions usually lead to big recoveries. And that's based upon those two dots in the upper right hand corner, the 82 recession, the 74 recession. We had big recessions and had big recovery. The one year recovery rate coming out of this recession was about two and a half percent. Okay, we grew far below what would have been predicted from that historical data. Now why is that? This is a messy picture to look at, but it makes a very important point. Okay? The red line is year-over-year -year consumption growth on the right axis. Okay? The shaded years are recessions. And I want to focus your attention on the two big recessions we've had in the last 35 years in the U.S. history, 1974 and 1982. As the recession was over, as you go out of those shaded pink areas, what you see is a big recovery in consumption. Consumption grew at 7% per year out of those recessions. What are we growing in this recession? About 2.5%. 3% is Randy's forecast. Well below average. So even though 3% is kind of a normal average of what consumption grows at, not out of recessions. Why? Because you and I don't want to spend. You and I want to build up our assets that we've been foregoing for the last decade. And you see it in the data. The savings rates popped up and we basically, as a, as a society, decided we're going to save a little bit more than we normally consume. So prediction two is that going to be this recession is going to have a recovery that's going to be less robust than we would have seen in the past. Because we have to undo the leveraging that we did during the boom and build up our stock of assets. So it doesn't mean that we're going to not be you know, sluggish forever. It just means we got some work to do and it's going to take a little bit more time. Third thing I want to talk to you about, and I love this. This is new. This is new. This is kind of what I've been working. I've been putting this talk together for a couple of weeks, and it's stimulated my mind, and I'm hopefully to put it into some new research now. Um, so this will be new to Randy and Regu as well. Um, not this part. This part is basically there's a huge variation in unemployment rates across U.S. states now. Some states, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, had very relatively low unemployment rates. Not zero unemployment, but about 7% in change. Other states, Nevada, California, Arizona, Florida, have unemployment rates up around 11, 12%, well above 10%. Fact one. Fact two. Hold on one second here. For the same thing that we saw in the early periods, when we started running up the share of production that went to housing, this is going to be the share of people who are in housing related industries. Okay? So the people who make the house, the amount of construction workers in the economy, the amount of mortgage bankers in the economy. And what I want you to notice is, relative to our long run trend, in 1997 we started reallocating a lot of workers into the housing production sector. This is a massive amount of reallocation of workers. Okay? We're basically talking over a 10 year period, we've shifted the nature of production in the United States towards making houses not only in output but in terms of inputs like workers. Fact three, and this is what I wanted you to focus on. The horizontal axis here is going to be, each one of those dots is a state. The horizontal axis is how much that state reallocated their workers towards producing houses during the run-up 2000 to 2006. So let's look at the bottom right-hand corner. You're going to see states like Nevada and Florida and Arizona, where six percentage points of their workforce got reallocated to producing houses. They used to have 10% of the workforce in those industries, and now they have 16% of the workforce in those industries. Where other states in that period on the horizontal axis didn't change their production mix by much. On the vertical axis is how much their production mix reversed during the recession. So how much did you go back towards, um, towards the, 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 the normal production? And what you see is that slope of that line is one. So Nevada had a 6% move in the boom and a 6% reserve reversal during the bust. Now let's correlate the same x-axis to how much people you moved into the housing sector during the boom and how much your unemployment rate, unemployment rate changed during the bust. And you can see there's a huge variation and it's positively correlated. The places with the biggest reallocation during the booms have the biggest unemployment rates during this recession. And then the third thing I want to say is, if we go to those states like Nevada that had this big misallocation during the boom, built a lot of houses, had a lot of construction workers, and then now have a lot of unemployment, where are those unemployed people coming from? So this axis in this, the vertical axis, is the share of the unemployment in that state currently that used to work in the housing sector. And 35% of all unemployed people in Nevada 
are construction workers and mortgage brokers. Okay, we had this big run-up during the, the boom period. We reallocated our workforce towards the production of housing. And now we stop producing housing. And as a result, we have all this extra workers that have to be reabsorbed into other sectors. So my last prediction that I'm going to make, oh, I'm going to say one other thing with this before I go into my last prediction, which is let's go now and ask if there's jobs out there. And there's a government survey called Job um, Jolts. It's Job and Labor Turnover Survey or something like that. Right now they track that there are about 3 million job openings in the United States. Okay? Of those job openings, less than about 50,000 of those are in construction industries. So the bulk of the unemployed are construction workers, but nobody's hiring construction workers anymore. So at some point we have to reallocate all these construction workers back into these other sectors to, to produce what we normally want to produce, healthcare services or government workers or um, biotech or whatever. So that takes time. So if I'm going to predict forward, we're not going to see big movements in unemployment in the short run. As a re why? Because we have the stock of these workers who are trained in construction. It took them a while, it took them a decade to get into that construction industry. And as a result, they have to get reabsorbed by other sectors. So I would expect us to see unemployment rates staying relatively high going into the future. I'm going to conclude now just with two comments. Um, and I think these are important for us to think about when we talk about policies for the recovery. Okay? So if this misallocation is truly important, okay, there might be limited policy options for us to stimulate house price growth, what politicians want to talk to us to do about doing, spur on economic growth, which politicians talk to us about wanting to do, and lowering the unemployment rate, which politicians talk to us about wanting to do. Why? Because we have a glut of housing supply out there. We have people who want to save and not spend, and we have a whole bunch of unemployed in certain sectors that we have to remove to other sectors. Now, that doesn't mean policy isn't going to be important when the Fed cuts interest rates, stimulating some sort of investment. But it's not going to be solving the glut of housing supply, the desire for us to save, and the fact that we have these workers in one industry that we have to move to another industry. And on a related point, we shouldn't respect this recession to get over quickly because the recession is a direct result of the boom that preceded it. And the boom took a decade to happen. For a decade, we reallocated our production towards these certain sectors. And to expect ourselves to undo that overnight just doesn't make sense. And what I want us to do, and I want policymakers to do, and I want academics to do, is start to realize that the boom that we're, or the bust that we're going through, the recession that we're going through, was directly related to the boom that we went through in the prior decade. There are not unrelated events. And if we realize that the boom was a result of this misallocation towards this housing sector, low savings on our part, increased purchases of, of housing, it's going to take time to undo. It took us a decade to get in. It's going to take us a little while to get undone. And I think that's something to think about as we go forward. I'm done. <clears throat>